Respiratory exchange ratio is often called RER or just R. And RER is the ratio of CO2 production, which is also known as the CO2, to oxygen use, also known as VO2, which we talked about in the last recording. And so as you know, when we are oxidizing our food, we use oxygen, we produce some ATP, some CO2, some water, and some heat. So we use oxygen, we produce CO2. Okay? And the ratio between those two values is called RER. And you're going to learn how to calculate RER and where those numbers come from. It's actually relatively simple. So why do we care about RER? Well, it is a numeric indicator of carbohydrate and fat contribution. So you know that when we are um, oxidizing our fuels to make ATP, it's not 100% fat or 100% carbohydrate. Each one of those fuels contributes. Okay? And depending on the situation, if you're at rest, fat is a greater contributor. Uh, as intensity of exercise increases, fat contributes less and less. Carbohydrate contributes more or more. So if we knew an individual's RER, we would have an indication of how much each of these fuels was contributing. And I'll tell you right now, and then you're going to see where these numbers come from, that if you were using 100% carbohydrate, which is theoretical, because you never would, your RER would be 1. If you're using 100% fat, your RER would be 0.7, okay? The reality is we're somewhere in between, okay? The closer your RER is to 1, the more carbohydrate you're using. The closer your RER is to 0.7, the more fat you're using. So how can RER tell us these things? Well, going back to Chapter 2, Remember that when we're oxidizing carbohydrate and fat, or, and or fat, we're using oxygen. Okay, remember we use oxygen in the electron transport chain. And also along the way, we are producing CO2. Okay, remember we produce CO2 in the intermediate step, just before Krebs cycle and we also produce CO2 in the Krebs cycle. Okay, so you know about these. These were in your drawings. You, you drew the CO2 production. Okay? When you drew the electron transport chain, which you should have done with the workbook, you actually drew oxygen use. So we're going to revisit those drawings and look at, at those things specifically. So VO2 and VCO2 are very easy to measure. We talked about in the last recording how to measure VO2. Okay, you put a mouthpiece on an individual, you measure how much oxygen they take in, you measure how much oxygen they blow out, and the difference is going to be how much oxygen they used, which is VO2. Okay? So at the same time that the body's using oxygen, it's producing CO2. So we can measure CO2 the same way, okay? but with CO2 it's reversed because you're producing CO2. We measure this amount of CO2 in your exhaled air. We subtract the amount of CO2 that you inhaled. Okay? So room air always has some CO2. It's going to be mostly oxygen, but there's some CO2. So some will be inspired each time and that would give us VCO2. So these two numbers would come from indirect calorimetry. Okay, this is something you would measure in lab. We're not going to be measuring these in class. You're not going to be doing these calculations in class.
in class, I would give you the values of VO2 and VCO2. I just want you to have an appreciation for where they come from. Once you have those values, then it's easy to calculate RER because RER is just a simple ratio, VCO2 over VO2. So if you know how much CO2 you produce, you divide it by the amount of oxygen you use, and that gives you your RER value, which is going to be at the very highest one and at the very least 0.7. So let's explain, let's go into a little more detail of carbohydrate and why 100% carbohydrate gives us an RER of 1. Okay, so what we're going to do is we are going to completely trace one blood glucose molecule all the way through. Okay, so here's our glucose molecule. And as we trace it, we're going to count, count, we're going to count how many oxygens end up getting used and how many CO2 end up getting produced, right? So remember, oxygen is used in electron transport, CO2 is used in the intermediate step, and in Krebs. Okay. And when we do this, we can fill in the numbers, CO2 production divided by Oxygen use should give us an RER of 1, and 100% carbon carbohydrate oxidation is 1, and then we'll talk about this later. Okay, so let's talk about where, how we get these numbers, and hopefully when we come up with these numbers by tracing a blood glucose molecule, we end up calculating an RER of 1. All right, so we start with blood glucose, and we go all the way through to pyruvate, okay? And remember, what we're paying attention to is oxygen use, CO2 production, okay? We do not use any oxygen in glycolysis. Oxygen is only used in electron transport, okay? We don't actually produce any CO2 in glycolysis either. Okay. But what we do get from glycolysis is two hydrogen electron pairs that go off to the electron transport chain. Okay, so keep this in mind. As a result of glycolysis, we go through the electron transport chain twice. Okay, I'm going to come back to that. All right, so you've got your blood glucose, okay, which ended up giving us two pyruvates, which feed into the intermediate step. Okay. Each time we go through the intermediate step, okay, and again, remember, we're looking at VO2, VCO2. Each time we go through the intermediate step, we produce one CO2, okay? But we have two pyruvates, so we go through the intermediate step twice, so we have two CO2s. Okay. We also have hydrogen and electron pair that goes through electron transport chain, and again, there's two pyruvates, so two intermediate steps. So we go through electron transport chain times two. So as a result of the intermediate step, we have two CO2s, and we go through electron transport twice. Now looking at Krebs cycle, we have, remember this is an error, each time we go through Krebs cycle, we get two CO2s, but again, starting with the glucose, we're going to go through twice, so we actually, down here in Krebs cycle, end up with four CO2s. Hydrogen and electron pairs, we get one, two, three, four. Okay, so four pairs go to electron transport, 
but there's actually eight pairs because we go through Krebs twice. So we go through ETC eight times as a result of Krebs cycle. We don't get any direct oxygen here, but we are going to use oxygen in electron transport chain. Okay, So keep these numbers in mind. All right, every time we drop off a hydrogen and electron pair, whether it's from NAD or FAD, we use a half of an oxygen. So from glycolysis, as a result of glycolysis, we go through ETC twice. Okay. Intermediate step, we go through electron twice. We get two hydrogen electron pairs. From Krebs, we go through electron transport chain eight times. Okay, so if you do the math here, two plus two plus eight. Okay, so when we completely oxidize a glucose molecule, we end up sending 12 hydrogen and electron pairs through electron transport chain. And every time we go through the electron transport chain, we use a half of an oxygen. So 12 times a half of an oxygen equals 6 oxygen. Okay. So to completely oxidize one glucose molecule, we use six oxygen molecules. Okay, so we use six oxygen, so our VO2 is six. Okay. Now for CO2, if you go back to the slides we just went through, remember we don't get any CO2 in glycolysis, but we do get um, one CO2 in the intermediate step, that's ding. that's dingo. We go through intermediate step twice, so we end up with two CO2s. Okay. We get two CO2 for Krebs. We go through Krebs twice, so that's four. So we have a total of six CO2s produced. So VCO2 is six. 6 over 6 is 1, which is what we were looking for. 100%. 100%, and I just realized this is the wrong slide, carbohydrate oxidation is one. All right. This is oxygen efficiency. Remember this term from chapter two. So we completely trace a blood glucose molecule through and we have established that we use six oxygens. How many ATP do we produce? Okay, that goes back to chapter two. Look back in your chapter two notes and your ATP counts, and you'll see that when we completely oxidize one blood glucose, we end up with 32 ATP. 32 divided by six is 5.3, and so this is the oxygen efficiency of carbohydrate. Okay. Remember, oxygen efficiency is how many ATP do we get for each oxygen molecule that we use. And this was the number that I gave you in Chapter 2. I told you the number, the absolute number wasn't really important. I just wanted you to understand that this number for carbohydrate is higher than the number that we would calculate for fat. Okay.
and uh, on the next recording I'll sh we'll go through the same process but we will do it for fat and you will see that the number that we come up with here for fat is going to be smaller than 5.3